Hey everyone, it's George Gross with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I am really excited to have my friend AJ Giuliani uh, joining us today. And AJ actually is someone I met years ago. We've become very good friends. He is easily one of the smartest people I know. He's pushed my learning in so many avenues. Not only is he an amazing educator, but he's an incredible dad, an incredible friend. And he's also co-author of the book Empower uh, with his uh, John Spencer. And uh, this is actually published by Impress Books. And I'm really pumped to have you, AJ, to kind of talk about, share some ideas, you know, to help educators. So can you uh, introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your background? Yeah, thanks so much again for having me on, George. Uh, we've been really good friends for a long time. And he's just always somebody that is going to tell me the truth. He's going <laughs> to challenge me. Yeah. And uh, about the only thing I try to give George advice on is kids, because I've got four and he's <laughs> you know, got one right now. So that's about the only thing I, I got on him. I love it. So yeah, I, I've uh, been an educator uh, now um, for a number of years, coming on two decades. Started off as a middle school and high school English teacher, football coach, lacrosse coach, and then moved into various instructional coaching roles, administrative roles, director of tech, director of learning innovation. And along the way, I uh, kind of caught that bug to really just start sharing my learning, whether it be blogging uh, or speaking, those different types of things, and eventually writing. And so Empower is, uh, is one of the books that I'm most proud about writing, written a number of books here, and was just happy to be uh, published by Impress. And you know, I think right now, uh, the work that I'm doing is really centered around you know, how, what does it look like? to empower students at school, at home, in all different types of environments? And what does it look like to empower staff as well uh, as leaders? I think, I think your work actually right now, the stuff that you've been talking about forever, I think a lot of people are embracing it, to be honest, whether they like it or not, right? Like it's the stuff that's going on in a world with coronavirus and, you know, um, yeah. things really changing on school, how teachers are adapting right now. How do you kind of see that intersection of like what you've been doing for years and why people are embracing it so much right now? I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier that this work of shifting our curriculum, our instruction, our assessment into more meaningful and empowering learning experiences, it's always been important work. Now it's imperative, right? Yeah. Now it's, there, there's, there's no excuse. It's right in front of us. We have to adapt and we have to do it. And I think for a long time, there's been a growing segment of educators and leaders who are saying, you know what, we've got to go beyond compliance. We've got to get kids engaged and ultimately empower them. But now, uh, kind of with everything that's going on, we're faced with what does education look like now? What do we want it to look like? And how can we actually do that work? And so I think there is that, that intersection between a lot of the work that many of us have been doing versus the time that we're in right now. And I, what I don't want people to feel is overwhelmed because uh, even in a situation that is not a global pandemic, it still is overwhelming to mm -hmm. sometimes try this. So we got to take it one step at a time. We got to be very practical, not just talk in the clouds, but also in the dirt. And I think that's something uh, that I've been really trying to do the past couple of years is just really try to make things practical for teachers and leaders. The, the goal is to just be whelmed. Yes, just, just whelmed, not whelmed. over. Not over, <laughs> not either, just whelmed. Just whelmed, I don't know, solid whelmed. No, no one ever says that, right? Like, Hashtag whelmed. Says, hey, I just want you to walk out of here whelmed today. Feel right? whelmed right now. <laughs> I don't even know, if, is that even a word on its own? It's like I'm an English, English teacher, I don't think it is, but it should be. I mean, it if, is now. you know. It it's, is now. It's, We're, it's, it's the right space. That's the title of this podcast, I think. It's just Be Whelmed. Whelmed. Be Whelmed. Whelmed. <laughs> That's it. I'm writing that down right now. Hey, um, I actually, before we kind of get into some of these got to. ideas. You got to. Yeah, I am. I'm actually putting that right there. When, when uh, before we get into some ideas and you're talking about how to get people whelmed, um, I, I, I shared a video that you shared with me, and it was awesome, of uh, your daughter's birthday which you know like she's 11 years old correct which yes. like sucks because you can't have like a birthday party but like tell everyone what actually happened it was it was really awesome to see yeah I mean so I just wrote a blog post about this because I think I was just taken aback as a, as a parent right so my my oldest kid she's 11 Kylie and I, my wife and I are just just worried you know it's her birthday we were gonna have this you know, birthday party with all our friends and uh, and everything and she knows that and so now we can't have that right and I was like the person that was kind of just like oh man it's gonna suck 
<laughs> I was I was yeah. kind of being negative. My wife was the one that like sprung to action, like planned kind of all these surprises, sent out Zoom links with her swim friends and her school friends and with both sides of our family so that she had stuff during the day and people wishing her a happy birthday. But probably the coolest thing that happened during the day and what was most unexpected is, you know, we live in a small town, a lot of close neighbors and friends and uh, her friends, all the parents and, and kids kind of had a text chat that had been going for a while, apparently, uh, and they planned to make signs and then do a drive-by, almost like a parade. And uh, we got a text like, hey, check, out, check outside your front porch in like two minutes. And we're like, what? Like, what's going on here? So all of a sudden, mm -hmm. we hear some like beeping and everything. And we walk out the front door, my, my daughter comes out there and it's like all her friends, the families driving the cars, signs out, everybody's saying happy birthday. And it's just, you know, it's one of those moments that makes you tear up as a parent and she's just like waving and like, you know, it's finally done. There's like 10 plus cars that roll by and she comes in, she's like, what the heck? You know, like it was That's just, awesome. it, it was such like a natural reaction to people showing compassion, especially in times like these. Yeah, it's like every every kid that's having a birthday right now is having a non-school month birthday, right? Like right. The, the, yes. the, the July, I was like, oh, all my friends are gone, right? And it, it was it was really inspiring to see. And I wasn't planning on actually um, talking to you, but I saw you I saw you keynote just recently. It was amazing. It was very um, not only was there a lot of uh, great ideas, but really emotional too. And you talk a lot about your brother. And yeah. so can you share a little bit about your brother's story? Yeah, so my brother, um, so I'm the oldest of, of four siblings. And uh, my brother's just two years younger than me. When we were just kids, he was diagnosed with neurofibromatosis. And so probably, I guess he was in first grade, kindergarten, first grade when it was diagnosed. And basically, it's little tiny tumors just all over your body. Mm -hmm. and, and so as you get older and older, it kind of gets worse and worse. And basically what it feels like is if you like hit that tumor, it's like a hammer's hitting it, you know? So um, I, I was, I, I now had a reason for why I was always beating him in fights uh, around mm -hmm. the house. And, and, and I also didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, but growing up with him, you know, he had this like awful disease. He, he, when he was going through puberty, he had interferon treatments, like missed an entire year of school, had multiple surgeries on his eyes where there were some tumors on his spine, like just crazy. And this dude was like the happiest, like just, just somebody that was friends with a lot of people, just, just made life awesome. And, uh, you know, he, he did some, some amazing things. And I, I shared in that, in that keynote, I was talking about how I think one of the shifts in his life is when he was a senior, he did this senior project where he was doing this whole big walk, this, this walk-a-thon for neurofibromatosis. And there was lots of obstacles, lots of hurdles, and there was tons of teachers and a principal that helped him get over those hop obstacles and actually do something that was pretty amazing, especially at the time. Um, and so he did this. And I think ever since, ever since that moment, it switched him to like being like, oh, like, yeah, I'm not that good of a student, but I can do big things in this world. And I think a lot of times kids need that because if, if you're not getting A's all the time, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't have that self-worth that you can do big things. And so that project gave him th that momentum. And uh, he did lots of amazing things like uh, starting organizations, uh, starting his own business, green, clean, and wash, just amazing things. And a couple of years ago, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer. He beat that. He got married to the girl of his dreams on a honeymoon. And six months later, he was diagnosed with cancer again after beating it. This time it was sarcoma it was all throughout his lungs, his liver. Uh, it was just, it was, a, it was a situation that compounded to itself. And uh, he passed away in August of 2018. Uh, he was just 33 years old. And one of the crazy things about those last couple months was while the rest of us were like really holding on hope, like hoping that doctors can, can work a miracle, uh, he was like planning his legacy. And so he developed this entire organization called Gabriel's Gladiators. And the entire focus of the organization was to help and support other people that were doing basically servant leadership on their own. Uh, instead of just kind of raising money for one cause, it was raising money for people that were supporting causes all around the globe. And so uh, he passed away, but his legacy really carries on, especially in this foundation. And it's just been powerful to see that ripple effect and impact 
that he had during his life and, and since he passed away. Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you, like, I know it's not really my place to say, but like, I know he's super proud of you. And I consider you like my little brother. Yes. Uh, that that's my little brother that's way smarter than me <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah seriously and and i just know that all the stuff that you've done to really empower kids to do really me- not just do school but to do meaningful things is i i think really representative of kind of what your brother taught you through all that right like i just i think it's really amazing um the work that you do to to really have kids do something meaningful, not only kids, but educators as well. Yeah. And I know it's kind of like, a, maybe not the best transition, but I think one of the things that you do so well is um, you're probably to me, one of the most knowledgeable experts in the idea of genius hour. And I know you do a lot of work with that. Like, how does that <laughs> tell us a little bit about genius hour for the people who maybe never heard of it, but also how you utilize it right now, like with within yeah. what's going on in the world. Yeah, I think, you know, it just connected to that story of my brother. Like they didn't call it genius hour, but his senior project kind of was like a genius hour. He got to choose something that he wanted to learn about. And then out of that learning, he could create something. Right. So he chose to learn about fundraising and then he created a fundraiser out of that. So genius hour, 20% time, passion projects, whatever you want to call it. The basic premise is kids get to learn something that they're passionate about, that they're interested in, that they would have a purpose uh, beyond just school uh, for learning. And then with that learning, they document the learning journey and they eventually create something based on that learning path. Uh, And so, you know, I think um, I got started in genius hour when, um, and I, I read a book, Dan Pink's book, Drive, and it was talking a lot about intrinsic motivation, and it gave lots of different examples, and I'm actually probably lying here. I think I just watched his TED Talk. I didn't read the book until years later, yeah. but I watched, you know, I, and, and so I, I saw this story about how Google gives their employees 20% of their time to work on whatever they're passionate about, and did that with my uh, class, found a bunch of other educators, a lot who are actually in Canada, Hugh McDonald, uh, Galit Z, Joy Kerr, mm-hmm. Uh, Denise Krebs, just amazing people that were doing this very early on. We created a community of sharing. And and basically what Genius Hour is that is um, you can connect to all kinds of standards and all kinds of curriculum, still giving kids choice in what they learn, right? And, And how they demonstrate that understanding. And right now with distance learning, it's one of the perfect projects to do because kids are at home. Um, they've got a device or maybe they don't have a device, but they still have interests. They still have, you know, curiosity. They still have things that are on their mind that they want to explore and learn about. And so giving them the opportunity during this time, during this moment to explore those things they're interested in, to document the learning process, right? Like we all like reality shows, fixer upper shows, chef shows, because we like watching the learning process. We like seeing this process. So allow kids to document that process, whether it's video, audio, or, or blogging, right? Um, to document that process and share what they're learning, actually create something based on that. Uh, and eventually what the goal was then is to present their findings, what they learned, present what they made with a true authentic audience. And there is so much available now to do that, right? I just had a class uh, in Pennsylvania that was sharing their genius hour stuff using Flipgrid's grid pals and basically connecting with other classrooms all over the world. So there's lots of tools out there uh, for that as well, free tools. Uh, and so I think right now in, in distance learning and remote learning, whatever we want to call it, genius hour is a perfect project to do because you're hitting reading, writing, nonfiction, speaking, listening, creating, all those different types of skills that you want to hit during school, you can hit in genius hour. And it's just right now, uh, top of mind for me, because people ask, hey, what are some things we could do? I'm always genius hours, a perfect way to get kids started in distance learning. Well, if you take that, if you take that idea, um, as I'm listening to you, one of the things that we can really embrace right now is there, there's like a huge concern. And I've seen people tweet about this, like, oh, my kid might not be ready, uh, you know, for university now because they were taking all these courses and stuff. I'm like, I'm like, I'm sure they have a pretty good note they could give to the professor next year. Like, Hey, going right. through a pandemic last year, right? Like, 
I, I think right. everyone's every, it's not like some of us have gone through this, right? Like this everybody is everybody, everybody. But what I'm, as I'm listening to you, I think this is a really good opportunity to, some of our kids are not going to be as good at school as they might've been by the end of the year, but all of our kids could be way better at learning. If, we, if yeah. that's what we're going to focus on. And I think, you know, that doesn't mean just the stuff that we like can measure, but really just really important skills that can help them develop, you know, just not right now, but after the fact. And it's a really interesting time. One of the things that I also thought about would be like, what, what would it look like right now if a lot of our admin administrators who are dealing, you know, like nobody's gone through this before and they're dealing with a lot of stuff. And I can see, you know, I see a lot of criticism. And, you know, it's just like the same thing with teachers, like people are trying to figure stuff out and, you know, same thing with leaders. But what if we really focus on as administrators to actually like create some genius hour time for our teachers in this time, right? Like it's the easiest yes. probably opportunity to actually do that. What, what could that look like? Yeah. And I think that the great thing about genius hour for staff is that right now, different staff are very interested in a variety of things, sometimes for their own uh, learning and professional development, but oftentimes because they want to be better at this new reality, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, teachers want to be good at teaching, whether it's blended, right. online, in-person, that type of thing. And I think what a genius hour allows them to do is like, it like gives them permission and almost um, celebrates the idea and makes time for the idea that their professional learning doesn't have to be about some new program, right? And it doesn't even need to be about some new technology. Right. Maybe they want to learn about choice boards because they saw somebody, you know, tweet out that choice boards are a great way to get kids learning. Or maybe they want to learn about hyperdocs because it seems perfect uh, in distance learning for allowing kids to choose their own path. Now they have time in a genius hour to explore those things. Uh, and it's, it's given them permission to kind of dive deep. And the cool thing about it is if you do that with staff and then they present out what they've been learning and their findings, now it gives permission to everybody else to talk to this person, that person, that person and say, hey, that's so cool. You learned all about that choice boards. How could I do that in my second grade class? How could I do that in my eighth grade, my physics class? What does that look like? Uh, and, it, and it makes the bonds a little bit tighter for the staff because people now see each other and experts in fields and areas that they may not have before. And I think as administrators, it is really important right now that where you're putting your investment is not into software, it's into people. W would you yeah. agree with that? Well, I mean, you know, you look at, I think most of the software that we're using right now for distance yeah. learning, you've already had access to. You're using your Google suite, you're using your Microsoft apps, yeah. uh, maybe using something like Zoom, which is, you know, a free, uh, you know, you're using some of these tools, like I mentioned, Flipgrid, which is free. There's not a need to buy some new fancy software in order to do a better job at distance learning. Right. There's just not. Oftentimes that complicates it. It's the professional learning that is important here because, while all of these tools have been tangential, like they've been kind of on the periphery of a lot of people's minds, now they're how you teach, right? So like, the, if, imagine if when they did gave smart boards to everybody, mm -hmm. you had to teach, that was the only way you could teach. Yeah. That, that's what we're in right now, right? These tools that we're talking about are, you need professional learning for the quality education practices, the best types of learning that can come from using these in meaningful ways, not think, just the software itself. And I, I think it's really important to focus less on cool right now and focus more on depth, right? And I think that's, yeah, we, we can get lost in the cool yeah. factor, you know, right? I, like, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you, if you, I'm, no, I mean, I guess like the, the thing to me is you can have both of those, right? Like yeah. it, it can be cool and it, and it can have depth, but you don't want to put the shiny over that right. deeper learning that can happen. And, and you know, I'm, I, I've been like that too. I'm already like, I read an article saying like zoom is over the number one uh, downloaded app in the app store right now is called house party. I'm like, what's well, house party. Why right. are all the kids downloading that? Why is that so much better than zoom? And so like my mind is immediately like, I need to try that out might not be the time to do that right now. 
right? Like, like that's okay to be interested in those types of things, but, but you do want to use some of the tried and true that you know can be effective. Yeah, a bunch of kids are probably downloading that over Zoom because they know all the adults are in Zoom. Exactly. Like, house, party, house party's taking over. I did download yeah. it. And guess and what? As soon my, as they find my first house party, as soon as they find out you're on house party, they're gonna go to something else. Oh, exactly. look at the look at the adults wrecking everything, right? <laughs> as George is single handedly ruining TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so we're. I want to. I want you to talk a little bit about um, your book and power, and just a little history of this book. PJ actually uh, sent it to me and he asked me to write the forward and I will not write the forward. I actually will not endorse any book without reading it first. Cause I want to know like what I'm connecting my name to. It, it's really important to me um, in the work that we actually do. So I, I, I read it and I was just blown away by the book and I actually said, Hey, I actually want to publish this book. Like I don't want to just write the forward. I want to publish it. And so AJ and John and I talked about it and I know if you're listening to the podcast, you probably can't see, but if you're on YouTube, the, it's amazing because it's, it's no offense, AJ. I don't think this is an offensive thing. It's not a really hard read, right? But no, it's not but at there's all. depth, right? And it's lots of visuals and, you know, really, really engaging material to lead to empowerment, right? To like, to hopefully inspire educators to really be empowered themselves to empower their students. So can you tell us a little bit about the book? I, I, I just absolutely love it. And I know I'm yeah. biased because I wrote the forward, but, but just to kind of go to the background, I wouldn't have written it if I didn't love it. Right. right. I, wouldn't right. Have, I wouldn't want to be connected to it, to be honest with you. So John Spencer and I wrote launch and uh, John is just a very gifted artist mm -hmm. and can make a lot of things with his sketches come to life a bit more. You know, they say a picture is a thousand words. And I, I think the sketches that we had in launch made it a book where like people were writing in it and like doing their own sketches and like coloring right. and like and so we saw this interaction when we wrote launch which we didn't necessarily we weren't expecting and um you know we're big fans of austin cleon he wrote steal like an artist uh keep going uh show your work some great books and it's just a highly visual book and so we were like why don't we write a book uh, around the core beliefs that we have as educators um, and, and, and what it looks like when students own their learning, like what are the shifts that you have to make? Right. Uh, and so we really centered in power around 10 main shifts, right? Like a, like one of the shifts would be a shift from required to, to desire. So from requiring kids to do something to allowing them to desire to doing mm -hmm. something. Right. Um, and so we built this, this book almost as something that you could read in a day. Like that was kind of the goal. Like, you know, like, like a, a quick read, you could read in a day or two. There's lots of pages, but lots of pages have a sketch or a couple of words or something like that. And so um, the main premise was school is really built around this idea of compliance and compliance is you're doing something because someone told you to do it and you're doing it as well as that person has laid out on a rubric or whatever it is for years schools have been talking about moving from compliance to engagement. We need to engage our students. How many people want to engage their students better? There's been tons of stuff on engagement. And, you know, Bill Ferreter says that engagement is getting kids excited about our standards, our curriculum, our interests, like the things that we have mm -hmm. to teach. There's state standards, all that kind of stuff. Empowerment is that next shift, right? Compliance, engagement, empowerment. And empowerment is now getting kids excited about their future their passions, their interests, while they're in school, not just for when they're outside of school. And so the core concept was about how do we make that shift? What does that look like in everyday teaching? What does that look like with our students? What does that look like in leadership? And uh, we just wanted to build out a very kind of clear, concise, visual storytelling type of book. And I think we did that. It's the most, it's the favorite book I've ever uh, written. John's fantastic co-author. Again, mm -hmm. the, the visual storytelling he does is great. And I think it just kind of it, like one of the things about working with Impress and you, George, is that like you'll challenge some certain things. I remember there was one specific part of the book and we were talking about like sharing the learning. And I think the way we had written it, it was talking about sharing the learning at the end. And I remember you sending like just a quick little email of just saying like, Hey, like, should, should we be sharing the learning during the entire process? 
I remember just having like a conversation yep. about them. Like, yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. Like it, it should be framed that way. That's something, you know, I believe and have, have done with students, but didn't make that in, in you know, explicit in the book. Uh, and so it just was, it was a really great kind of relationship to build that out. And since then, I think it's taken on a life of its own. It's had lots of people read it, lots of book clubs um, and, and lots of folks that have kind of gone to that visual style also in their books and those different types of things. So just, again, just a, a excited to be able to kind of continue to share the message of that book because it is the core belief that I have as an educator. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up. I, I actually remember that conversation. And one of the goals we have with Impress is we don't actually take on a ton of authors every year. We, our goal is to basically take on between four to six. And the reason why we want to do that is to basically have like an educator eye to challenge some things that yeah. someone's writing to really get them to think different about it. And th that actually whole process came out when I wrote Innovator's Mindset with Katie Martin. Or I, they didn't write it with Katie Martin, but Katie Martin went through every single thing as I was writing it. And she would challenge me. And I was like, this is a really good process to have like an educator eye on this. You know, another educator that is challenging me, pushing my thinking, and maybe, you know, knows me and has built a relationship with me and knows yeah. I'm trying to say something, but it's coming out in a totally different way. And so we wanted like our author, we want our authors to to grow through the process. We don't want them just to write a book. We want them to become better educators through the process as well. And, and for us too, like we're becoming better educators kind of going in that back and forth. I think one of the things about empower that's really important is we ask our educators to empower our students, but then we, we then expect compliance, you know, as administrators. So it's really crucial, you know, kind of going back to the idea that, you know, AJ and I were talking about earlier, how do you, how do you create, like, if you want genius hour kids as an administrator, then you got to create it with your staff and give them that flexibility and build that trust because compliance is, is like a trickle down effect, right? Like if yeah. I expect my teachers to do certain things and they got to be, do it this way and this way, then it's really easy to fall into that trap because, you know, now I got to get, I got to please my administrator. So you kids better do it this way, this way, this way. So I don't get in trouble. Right. Um, the last thing I'm going to ask you, AJ, and I've been asking this of all the people I've had on is right now with everything that's going on in the world, what, what would you say is your best advice to help educators? I, mean, I you know, I think the, the best advice that I would, I would say is that there is no instructional manual of how to do this well, but there's a lot of people who've been doing distance and remote learning for a very long time. Right. Like I got, I got my master's in global and international education from Drexel University. It was completely distance learning program. It was mm -hmm. all online. There was people from all over the world. That was 10 plus years ago. And, and the reason I bring that up is that there is a lot of teachers out there that live in rural areas, that are working in virtual schools already, that are doing things that if you want to talk to another English teacher that has done virtual learning, they're out there. Like there's mm -hmm. people on Twitter sharing things. There's people that are, that are on YouTube that are, that are doing podcasts. They're doing that. And so I just want to tell people like, you're not alone. And this isn't the first time, like, obviously this situation is the first time this has ever happened that we're all in this pandemic situation and everybody's moving to remote learning, but it's not the first time remote learning's ever happened. And right. so I feel like that should give some sense of comfort to like, there are some like really good educational practices of what this looks like. You don't have to build every build everything from scratch. And I think sometimes as teachers and school leaders, we have this notion that like we got to do it all on our own sometimes. Like we we place this burden on our shoulders of like having to do it all ourselves. There are so many people out there right now sharing resources, sharing their experiences, all those types of things. And I get it. It can be overwhelming, right? Um, but just find somebody that is specifically in your avenue and, and see what they've done. Start a dialogue uh, and build from there. And, and don't feel like you have to do it all perfect. Don't feel like you have to uh, be amazing at it. Just try to get better, you know, and, and learn from, from other people. And I, I love that advice. And I think one of the things I'm seeing right now is people are like, well, don't compare yourself to other people and stuff like that. And it's almost deterring people from actually yeah. going online and seeing this stuff. And just understand that everyone's in different parts of their, of their journey, right? And that, that educator that's doing what we deem as really amazing things in this space right now, also started at zero. 
they started at zero at some point. They're just on a different part of their journey. And for me, you know, it's, it's a lot on the, how we receive the information and how we take it personally. And so I see a lot of people doing really incredible things that are way out of what I'm doing. Yeah. And my first focus is, okay, how do I learn from that? So I can grow, not like, well, I'll never get there. And it's, it's kind of like when I've seen educators, like, Oh, if you're on Twitter, I used to be like this, if you're on Twitter, like you're, if you're not on Twitter, you're irrelevant. Right. Like that was a whole thing for a long time. Right. And, and the reality of it is, you know, when did you start in 2015, like eight years before, you know, right. like, and I, and like a lot of people were saying that way before I got on and stuff like that, just understand that people are on different journeys, but we have to be open to that learning as we go. It's not, I think there's a difference between people that are sharing because they're like, like, look, look what I did. Like I'm amazing right. and way better than you, as opposed to like, Hey, here's what we're doing and take these ideas and modify them. And I think we have to be open to that. Because I'm like, I'm learning a lot through this process too. And it's because I'm trying to watch what others are, are doing and learn from that process. Yeah. And, I, and, and honestly, just showing the kids too, that we're master learners, yeah. right? Like, like, okay, maybe the first two weeks where you're doing Zooms, you're just having a, a regular class and you're going through stuff. Then all yeah. of a sudden you try to use the breakout rooms. Like, I, you know, and just, and you're saying, Hey, we're just going to try this. We're going to see what it looks like as yep. teachers, my first time doing it. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, two weeks after that, now you've got some kids leading the breakout rooms, right. And creating their, like, it, there is gradual steps to being more comfortable of doing this. And mm -hmm. the first time you take that leap, it's, it's not going to go perfect, but it's going to be a learning experience. And I think right. sharing it like that with the kids too, and putting yourself out there, um, I think allows for that relationship building to happen quicker because they realize like, man, this is a lot for everybody, including my teachers. Right. Yeah. Well, AJ, I, I really appreciate I, I know I've taken a lot of time. We talked for probably about 40 minutes before this too. <laughs> yes. um, but Hey, thanks for coming on. I, I, for those, uh, those who cannot see, cause they're not um, watching this on YouTube. AJ has like the best shirt ever. The NBA jam, Charlotte Hornets. Love it. Look at that. Um, Look at that. That's old school. That's old school. Grand, grandma and, and <laughs> Zoe. Grandma. <laughs> well, hey, thanks for doing this. And anyone who's listening, I really encourage you to check out Empower. It's a, it's, it's a really amazing book, but it applies to so much of the work that we're doing. But it's also really easy to take the context and the terms because I'm seeing, you know, a lot of teachers feeling a pressure of like delivering information, but it's really like, how do we get our kids to create? How do we get our kids to share? So AJ, thanks for um, taking time to do this today. I, I hope a lot of educators get to hear some of your ideas and um, make sure you connect with AJ at his uh, blog, Twitter, and Instagram. Could you share those with everybody really quick? Yeah. Again, thanks for having me on George. Just uh, always awesome chatting with you, especially talking shop like this and, yeah. and especially during kind of this moment where I think we're, we're really doing this imperative work and teachers everywhere, honestly, are, are really, I think, just, just making me proud to be an educator, you know, yeah. uh, of, of seeing, seeing what, what people are doing. Uh, you can find uh, all of my work at ajgiuliani.com. Um, all my virtual learning stuff's at ajgiuliani.com slash virtual. And then just on Twitter, um, at ajgiuliani, Instagram, learning with AJ. Uh, but everything is linked from my website, ajgiuliani.com. So hop on over there. Yeah, and AJ's Instagram is blowing up. <laughs> yeah. Sharing lots just, of awesome just, stuff. Just starting to do Instagram. It's fun. Yeah, if you want to follow AJ on Instagram, go to at G c o u oh that's how you spell it. that's the that's the greek way of spelling it yeah that's the greek way of spelling it the, the g is silent <laughs> yes <laughs> anyways thanks for having uh, thanks for taking time buddy i hope you have a great day All right, thanks appreciate right, it Take keep care. doing the good work everybody